This is the IEEE Computer Society Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series brought to you by the Distinguished Visitors Program. The Distinguished Visitors Program delivers tools for individuals at all stages of their professional careers through visits to chapters, offering opportunities for individual interactions, and to the membership through webinars by respected professionals. We have distinguished visitors around the world who cover machine learning, cybersecurity, robotics, big data, cloud computing, blockchain, and cryptography, among others. Chapters can request a distinguished visitor on computer.org slash distinguished visitors. The Distinguished Visitors Program is able to pay up to $1,000 for a visit to a chapter, but by working with other nearby chapters to develop a tour, that amount can be increased. So when your chapter is planning its next event, think of the Distinguished Visitors Program. Welcome to our Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series. My name is Kerry Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee our more than 600 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping tasks before we move on. You can ask your questions in the Q&A panel. Dr. Abate will answer as many questions as she can following the presentation. When you're writing your questions, if it relates to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that slide. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after the webinar. Diversity and inclusion are central to the mission of IEEE Computer Society and all of our, in all of our activities. This year alone, over 14,000 articles on gender, compu gender in computing have been featured in the Computer Society Digital Library including over 200 papers from the IEEE Transactions on Visualization and Computer Graphics Journal, which, is, which publishes peer-reviewed research monthly. Furthermore, you can connect and grow with other professionals through our various networks, such as the IEEE Women in Engineering Community, which offers uh, awards, star programs, and events. Our conferences information will be uh, shared after the webinar. You can also learn more at computer.org. In today's webinar, Dr. Janet Abate will examine five historical lessons about gender and computing. The history of women's participation in computing is the story of overcoming bias and barriers, but also of ingenuity, pleasure, and achievement. What lessons can be learned from women's experiences in, uh, from the beginnings of computing to the present? How has the broader phenomenon of gender affected the profession of computing? Dr. Abate's talk explores how ideas and social structures of gender have influenced innovation, uh, opportunities, skill, career paths, and the social organization of computing. Insights gained from the historical examples can, be, can help to explain continuing gender imbalances in the computer field as well as suggesting ways to create more equitable and inclusive computing culture. The webinar is brought to you as a partnership between the Distinguished Visitors Program, the IEEE Computer Society Histor History Committee, and the Computer Society of Baltimore Section Chapter. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Janet Abate is Professor of Science, Technology, and Society at Virginia Tech. She received her BA from Harvard University and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Her research is focused on history, culture, and policy of computing. She wrote the first book, Scholarly History of the Internet, Inventing the Internet, in 1999. Her 2012 book, Recording Gender, uh, women Changing Participation in Computing explores how gender has shaped computing and how experiences of, fem of female software pioneers can inform current efforts to broaden participation in science and technology. Her current research investigates the history and social significance of computer science as a discipline. Dr. Abate, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you to the IEEE Computer Society for inviting me to speak today. For my book, Recoding Gender, I interviewed 52 women who started computing careers from 1944 to the early 1980s. Their experiences were shaped in various ways by gender stereotypes about technical skill and by gendered expectations embedded in labor laws and the organization of work. They told stories of overcoming bias and barriers, barriers <clears throat> with ingenuity and persistence 
but many of these barriers still remain. And gender in computing is not just about the experiences of women. Much of what we consider the default normal computing environment is actually a masculine culture. Gender as a binary system has also been ingrained in computing, whether it's databases that only have two choices for gender or employers who fire transgender workers. Today, I want to consider five ways in which history can show us how gender has been ingrained in computing and some ways to counter the effects of gender bias. In the past, gender shaped women's career opportunities in obvious ways. They were denied access to education in science and engineering. Job listings were segregated by sex with the computer jobs listed under help wanted male. There was open and legal discrimination in hiring and pay. And there were paternalist labor laws and policies that prohibited women from working at night or when pregnant or from doing things like lifting a box of printer paper because that was considered too strenuous for a delicate female. In the face of these obstacles, women showed creativity in improvising their own opportunities. Programming language guru Gene Samet defied gender norms by answering an ad for a male job in computing to start her career. Other women leveraged their existing skills to move into computing jobs at their current employer. For example, in 1953, Mary Coombs was an accountant at the Lyons firm in England, which ran a chain of tea shops. When the company built the path-breaking path -breaking Leo computer, which was considered the first business computer, she volunteered to retrain to program the accounting system. Another woman took the initiative to learn to code on the job and moved up from being a secretary to becoming an entry-level programmer. Today, most of the formal barriers I've mentioned have been removed by changes in law and culture, yet we have a long way to go before we achieve gender equity. There are roughly three times as many men as women in computer science degrees and jobs in the United States. One thing we can notice from the examples I've given is that women's career paths were, uh, were often accidental and circuitous. While most men have entered computer careers straight from math or engineering backgrounds, women often majored in unrelated fields or worked in unrelated areas before something clicked and encouraged them to transition to computer work. For example, Hilary Kahn earned a degree in Latin and Greek in the mid-1960s and initially aspired to be an archaeologist. When she was unable to get a job in that field due to sexism, she became interested in computers earning a graduate degree as, um, and eventually chairing the computer science department at Manchester University. Fran Allen, who excelled as a researcher at IBM and became the first woman to win the prestigious Turing Award, started her working life as a high school math teacher. Lori Keller was an English major whose fascination with languages led her to take a, Fort a Fortran class in college and that eventually led her to a job as the first female lecturer in computing at the UK Open University. This difference in the shape of career paths is one way that opportunity is gendered. People who are concerned about gender balance in computing often talk about the so-called pipeline, where you take computer science classes in high school, then major in CS in college, then get a computing job or go on to grad school. But that linear pipeline model really reflects the masculine experience. Even though the legal barriers to women are now gone, it's still the case that many women who could potentially thrive in computing are not going directly into the field. So we should take a cue from history and think about how to recruit women who have started down other paths. How can we train people later in life? And how can we value and draw on the non-computing skills that they have acquired? For example, some of the women I interviewed arranged to earn their computer science degree in parallel with employment rather than having to do it beforehand. Another gendered aspect of career paths is timing. Assumptions about the optimal timing of career milestones, which are based on masculine patterns, can turn into constraints for women. First of all, there's a pervasive belief that technical careers must start young. Margaret Murray wrote a book about the career paths of female mathematicians in the United States, and she talks about what she calls the myth of the mathematical life course, where you have to show your genius at a very young age, and then you're washed up by age 30. But this reflects the masculine experience. Murray found that women mathematicians tended to have their greatest achievements at a later age in life. So this myth hurt them because they did not fit the stereotype. 
of what a good mathematician looks like. We see some of this in computing as well. For example, the ACM has an award named after Grace Hopper, which is for women under age 35. Uh, but the irony is that Grace Hopper herself didn't start her computing career until age 37. Late bloomers can still be leaders. Carnegie Mellon did a study in the early 2000s to see how they could increase the number of women admitted to their computer science major. One of the things they looked at was the preference they were giving to applicants who had done programming activities prior to college. They just assumed that these applicants, mainly boys, would be better qualified. But when they actually took the trouble to look at the data, they found that pre-college computer experience made no difference to success in this computer science major. So once again, gendered assumptions about timing worked against women. If we want more women in computing, we shouldn't send the message to teenage girls that if they're not interested in coding right now, they might as well forget ever having a career in computing. The idea that all successful tech careers start when you're a teenager is based on a masculine stereotype and perpetuates a biased idea of what talent looks like. Women's past successes in forming alternative and often later career trajectories can help us think outside the pipeline. Skill, talent, ability is another area where gender has shaped our perceptions. Traditionally, technical skills have been gendered masculine and valued more, while social skills are gendered feminine and valued less. But creating a piece of software or a large research project requires more than math and a knowledge of coding languages. You also need to communicate with your clients to understand the requirements and work together as a team to coordinate different pieces of the project. These people skills are often undervalued and unrewarded, even though they may be essential to project success. This also reflects a gender biased assumption that technical skills traditionally identified with men are much harder to learn than social skills. But is this really true? Is there any evidence that it's easier for engineers to pick up social skills than for socially adept people to learn coding? The record of, the record of software engineering failures, which are often caused by getting the requirements wrong through ineffective communication with the end users, suggests otherwise. At the very least, emphasizing the need for both types of skill can help more women see computing careers as a good fit for all of their talents. Even in the technical domain, there's no single objectively definable set of skills for any job. Instead, employers have to try to devise some test of competency that will approximate what they think the job requires. These measures often embed gender bias or have differential effects on men's and women's opportunities. This is easy to see when you look back in history to when the field was new. When computers first became commercially available in the 1950s, employers struggled to recruit and retain programmers, and they openly admitted their confusion about what made someone right for the job. Different managers tried different recruiting strategies. Some assumed that programming was a learned skill, and following this logic, they looked for people with experience, regardless of their academic background. Others thought that programming required mathematical or scientific training, and they sought people with college degrees or coursework in these fields. Still others believed programming success required innate ability or aptitude, and there were widely used programmer aptitude tests, such as the one devised by IBM, that were supposed to ferret out the hidden ability uh, to program, even in people with no training or experience. It's important to note that aptitude classroom learning, and real-world experience are three fundamentally different conceptions of talent, and they have different consequences in a labor market that was and remains highly gendered. For example, if employers believe that specialized education is the key qualification, then anything that deters women from getting a STEM education effectively keeps them from jobs. Conversely, if employers believe that some people are born with an aptitude for programming, then women who score well on an aptitude test could find themselves instantly qualified to be hired as entry-level programmers, even with no coursework or experience. Um, testing had its own limitations, by no means was that perfect, but the use of tests did help some women overcome educational barriers and get a foot in the door. Today, uh, computer job interviews often include asking the applicant to stand at a whiteboard and code a problem on the spot. This may seem like an objective test of skill, 
but the high pressure situation favors those with the confidence and coaching that male and white applicants are more likely to have acquired. There is no single right answer to the question of how to identify talent in computing. My research found that high achieving software innovators and computer scientists came from diverse academic backgrounds and experiences. So we should think more broadly about what measures we use to assess skill and whether they unintentionally perpetuate gender bias. Gender has been used as an organizing principle for the division of labor for all of recorded history. In modern industrialized countries, this historically meant, first of all, that people were expected to form heterosexual marriages, and secondly, that within the marriage, the man would work full-time for pay and the woman would work unpaid in the home. The economic unit in this gendered labor system is not the individual, but the married couple. Thus, one justification for paying men more for the same job was that they needed to earn a quote-unquote family wage. Women were not expected to be supporting themselves or their children, except on a temporary basis until they found a husband, which was the rationale for paying them less for the same work. Women were also routinely fired upon becoming pregnant, and women who had to support themselves did not fit into the normative gender system and therefore were not accommodated in the labor system either. Obviously, much has changed in the past 60 years. The majority of women now work outside the home, female-headed households are common, and civil rights legislation in the 1970s outlawed explicit hiring and pay discrimination. But the gendered assumptions built into the organization of work linger on. Some of the systemic aspects of work organization include physical spaces, work hours, and the accommodation, or more likely lack of accommodation, for family responsibilities. Early computer workplaces were designed for people with male bodies. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the lack of women's bathrooms. It seems that every woman I interviewed had some kind of anecdote involving bathrooms. Thelma Estrin recalled applying for a job at the RCA laboratories in Princeton in 1951 and being rejected because they didn't have a ladies room. Lucy Slater did PhD work at Cambridge University, also in 1951, and discovered that there was only a men's toilet. The men didn't want to share, but she refused to walk over to another building just to use the restroom, so she persuaded them to institute a system where everyone would whistle or sing while they were in the restroom so that there would be no unexpected encounters. Other spaces in the workplace have been gendered as well. Machine rooms, where computer operators worked, were often considered masculine spaces because of the association between men and large machines. Anne Hardy, who was one of the first employees at the Tim Share Company in 1966, said that women were barred from jobs in the computer center until the mid-70s on the pretext that their presence would be, quote unquote, distracting to the male employees. Office spaces could also be gendered masculine by hanging pinups of naked women on the walls. As Lori Heller, Lori Keller announced, uh, sorry, as Lori Keller encountered when she worked for Philips Electronics in 1974. When the female programmers' complaints were ignored, they fought back by hanging a playgirl centerfold of a nude man on the wall. This outraged the men and eventually led to a truce where all nude pictures were banned from the office. The simple fact of having to work in an office, far from one's home, is part of the gendering of space in a society where women still do most of the caregiving. Working from home can make it easier to balance work and family, but until recently, employers have been reluctant to consider that. Likewise, a requirement for extensive travel may also be an obstacle for women with children. Chris Warner got a job teaching computer science in 1975 and planned to get a PhD in the field until a senior male colleague warned her that Quote, it was not worthwhile to try to establish an academic career unless she could travel extensively to conferences. And he pointedly asked her if she wanted to leave her family behind to do so. She ended up dropping the PhD and going into computer administration instead. Another gendered aspect of work organization is the hours. Devoting most of your waking hours to paid work only makes sense if there is someone else, usually a wife, who is maintaining the home and taking care of the kids. We've changed that social system, but we haven't adjusted work hours to compensate. Many women, and I think many, women, many men as well, 
in the computer field have wished for the option to work part-time so that they could maintain their technical skills while also making time for their families. But part-time work has been persist persistently stigmatized as a sign that employees are not really committed to their jobs or as a dead-end mommy track. The association of full-time work with professionalism is a legacy of the gender workplace that has been very difficult to change. It also matters when those hours are. Working at night has been associated with masculinity. Women were not supposed to be on the streets at night for fear uh, for their safety, and women were not supposed to work with men at night for fear of sexual impropriety. But as we all know, computer work often involves late nights, and that was especially true in the mainframe era when people had to share a single machine. Women often had to fight to be allowed to work at night. Mary Lee Berners-Lee, the, the mother of World Wide Web creator Tim Berners-Lee, worked at the Ferrati Computer Company in Manchester, England in the 1950s. Ferrati had built a computer for the university and had the use of it during the off hours, which met between midnight and 8 a.m. But at first, the Ferrati personnel department did not allow female programmers to work those hours because they would be there at night with the male maintenance engineers. Berners-Lee and her other female colleagues protested this. Then the personnel department wanted them to have a chaperone watching over them, which the women managed to veto as well. All of these rules reinforce the message that women don't belong in computing. Paula Hawthorne had a similar problem when she started graduate school in computer science at UC Berkeley in 1974. Hawthorne was a single parent, and her first day in the program, her assigned advisor told her that she should drop out because, quote, you cannot be a serious student if you have children. She ignored that, but when she tried to schedule computer time to do her research on operating systems, she was told it would have to be from midnight to 3 a.m. Since she couldn't leave her kids alone in the middle of the night or afford an overnight babysitter, she thought she might have to drop out after all. Fortunately, she was able to switch to, an switch to another research specialty, uh, databases, where she was one of the pioneering uh, Ingress database developers. The professor there had his own computers, and she could work during the day. These stories illustrate how work hours that were unproblematic for men could be a huge obstacle to women due to stereotypes about sexuality and unequal burdens of childcare. This leads to the third structural issue, which is how the organization of work is not designed to accommodate caring for a family. At first, this was extreme. Until the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was passed in 1978, women in the US could legally be fired when they became pregnant. But even after the law was changed, workplaces in general were not family friendly. The women I interviewed were more fortunate than most, actually, because having computer skills made them valuable to employers, and some of them were able to negotiate keeping their jobs after having a child. Our recent experience in the COVID pandemic has shown how far these systemic problems are from being solved. Women have dropped out of the labor force at disproportionate rates as their ability to work and care for their families abruptly shifted from a difficult balancing act to a total impossibility. At the same time, though, the pressure of the pandemic has forced many employers to finally accommodate workers' desires to work from home, which has finally brought about some of the flexibility that women have been asking for for decades. This brings me to my next point, which is that social innovations can be as important as technical ones. Two of the most remarkable women I interviewed were Elsie Shutt and Stephanie Shirley, who were entrepreneurs at the very dawn of the software industry. Elsie Shutt started her company, Computations Incorporated, in Massachusetts in 1957, which was just a couple of years after the first male-headed software company uh, had been started, really at the beginning of the field. Stephanie Shirley started Freelance Programmers Incorporated in England in 1962. Both of them were highly accomplished software developers who had had successful careers in industry until they became pregnant. But instead of giving up their careers, each of them independently came up with a radical innovation starting a software business with the explicit aim of providing part-time jobs for female programmers who wanted to continue working while raising children. Uh, this is from a, a Business Week profile of Elsie Shutt. Um, she did not normally have her child sitting on the floor. That was just a photo op uh, that they set up. 
Um, Shut and Shirley successfully reinvented what a tech business could look like. And they succeeded brilliantly doing what the mainstream employers had said was impossible. First of all, they challenged the bias against part-time work and working from home, which most employers simply refused to offer. It was just considered unprofessional. Um, and Stephanie Shirley told an anecdote that when she was working from home, she had a tape recording of somebody typing so that it would sound like she was working in an office um, because that would be more professional than working from home. Um, so they, they set it up so that their employees could do the initial coding at home on paper, which was typical of the time, using coding sheets. And then they would come to the client's facility uh, periodically to run the programs on the actual computer. Secondly, in order to manage a part-time decentralized workforce, Shutt and Shirley had to innovate new management techniques to divide, track, and coordinate programming tasks. So they were innovating um, on a number of levels at once. And they did all this in a brand new, highly competitive industry where the failure rate for even male-headed firms was very high. We need more visionaries who can innovate ways to empower workers and accommodate their full lives rather than reproducing a two-tier system of full and part-time work with unequal rewards. How can we encourage people to innovate not just technology, but the workplace itself? Our ultimate goal should not be just to get women into the system, but to empower women and others to change the system to be more equitable and diverse. This brings me to my last point, <clears throat> that gender is not just about women or about cis people. When talking about gender, it's easy to focus only on women. My own historical research has centered the experiences of women in computing and how gender issues affect them. But gender applies to everyone. It's not just the biases that limit, that limit women's participation. It's also the way masculinity shapes the norms of computer culture and the way gender binaries have constrained opportunities for trans people. The culture of many computer firms is a specifically masculine culture. One of the most blatant manifestations is sexual harassment, which became more visible with the Me Too movement, um, but certainly has been going on um, for the entire time that I interviewed women. It doesn't seem to have significantly approved. Uh, a 2020 report by the group Women Who Tech um, surveyed uh, women in computing and founders of tech companies and found that conditions had not improved for them in the past three years. Uh, the majority of women reported being harassed, um, often by the venture capitalists they were trying to raise money for, uh, money from. But masculine culture goes uh, beyond sexuality, sexual harassment. It also shapes work practices in more subtle ways. Masculine values such as overwork, competition, and hyper-individualism, with the resulting de-emphasis on life balance, communication, and mutual support, are ingrained in this culture. But because masculinity has long defined workplace norms, these behaviors are seen as neutral, as simply defining the normal or ideal tech worker. We can't see the masculinity in them. One intervention on behalf of gender equality would be to recognize that these behavioral preferences are not universal or necessarily beneficial. There is a historical precedent for this in the work of Gerald Weinberg. In the 1950s and 60s, Weinberg had managed large software projects for IBM, including the system for NASA's Project uh, Mercury uh, space program. Drawing on these experiences, in 1971, he published the classic book, the Psychology of Computer Programming, in which he criticized programmers who kept the details of their code secret so that only they could fix it, and programming managers who fostered an atmosphere of macho competitiveness. According to Weinberg, managers tend to select themselves from the aggressive component of society. They are especially at a loss to understand the smooth functioning of a programming group based on mutual respect for individual talent and cooperation in the common cause. Weinberg advocated for what he called egoless programming, to urge coders to share their code, communicate with team members, and focus on the good of the whole project rather than just their own piece of it. 
Several of the women I interviewed spontaneously brought up Weinberg's call for egoless programming as a welcome confirmation of what they already knew, which was that work practices that seemed normal and neutral to men actually had a masculine bias that could be counterproductive. More recently, a 2020 report by Elsevier on gender in scientific research confirms that collaboration is essential for research and innovation, and that collaboration suffers in a male-dominated environment. Um, as I note, research is increasingly collaborative, and studies have demonstrated that proportion of women in a group is one of three key factors that correlate with the collective intelligence of that group. But the culture of the computer industry still romanticizes the lone genius and does not necessarily reward collaboration. My point here is not that there is no value to, tra to traditional masculine traits, but that there needs to be a balance that recognizes and rewards both ambitious individualism and the commitment to and competence in skills of communication and collaboration. This could help the field of computing become more diverse more productive, and build better products. Having an industry dominated by men creates huge blind spots when it comes to innovation. Think of the recent news about Mark Zuckerberg and his apparent lack of urgency about the harms that Instagram is posing to teenage girls. I would argue that Zuckerberg is ill-equipped to understand the ramifications of this technology that he controls because he has never had his own self-worth equated with his physical appearance. Most male tech executives have never been sexually harassed at work. They don't receive death threats like women do simply for expressing an opinion online. They don't receive rape threats for criticizing the status quo. For male innovators, using the internet is as safe as walking down the street. And that's the problem, because the safety of walking down the street is a completely different calculation for women and men, not to mention for queer and straight people or for black and white people. So men are not as equipped to anticipate the problems that can come when tech amplifies existing stereotypes and unequal power relations. They're caught off guard, which is not a quality you want in an innovator. We need people at the table who understand what it's like to be vulnerable and will use that understanding to make better design decisions. A historical example of this is how computer scientist Anita Borg created an online community for women in computing back in 1987. This was before social media, before the web, even before some computer scientists had email access. So it, it was an innovative move. <clears throat> Borg set up a mailing list called Sisters for uh, women in computer systems research. And the impact was powerful because women were such a minority in computer science that often a person would only be acquainted with a few other women in the field. Borg recalled, before sisters, before sisters existed, there was no community of women in computing. We all existed as individuals. We had a few women we knew, but there was no notion of how many women were out there doing what. The community that Borg built using sisters uh, also helped her to organize the first Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing in 1994, which is now an annual conference. In contrast to Zuckerberg, the people who designed and maintained sisters were women who were very aware of the hostile treatment that women sometimes received in male-dominated forums. They therefore proactively designed it as a moderated system with explicit rules for respectful behavior. This kind of proactive awareness could have helped us avoid a lot of problems we now have with social media. One last way I want to mention that uh, gender has shaped computing culture is through the notion of gender as a binary. Until recently, our cultural ideas about gender have formed a rigid binary where people are expected to be either male or female and to stay in that category from birth to death. This system has been oppressive for people in computing or any other field who are non-binary or transgender. Former IBM engineer Lynn Conway is probably the best known transgender person in computing history. Conway joined IBM in 1964 and helped build a supercomputer called the Advanced Computing System. But when she transitioned from male to female in 1968, she was fired by IBM's upper management. She restarted her career under a new name, 
joined Xerox PARC in 1973 and became a superstar of VLSI chip design. She received the Computer Society's 2009 Computer Pioneer Award for her contributions to superscalar architecture. While Conway was extremely successful as a woman in computing, it was not until 1999 that she came out as transgender to her colleagues, and then only because of her early work at IBM was receiving new attention from historians. She has since become a transgender icon and activist. As for IBM, the company formally apologized to Conway in 2020, and more importantly, in the past 20 years, IBM has put in place a number of protections and services for transgender employees, and is now ranked as one of the best workplaces for LGBTQ employees. In conclusion, history teaches us to look at gender as a multifaceted phenomenon. It affects computer culture both in obvious ways, such as stereotypes, sexual harassment, and bias against non-gender conforming people, as well as more subtle and structural ways, like the organization of work and the ways we perceive and reward talent. History also provides us with examples of how people have creatively overcome gender bias, and it can give us ideas and inspiration for how we can make computing a more equitable and welcoming field for everyone. Thank you. I think I ended a little early, but that's more time for Q&A. If anybody has any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to take them. Uh, Dr. Abate, thank you. This has been a great presentation. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, um, are, you had mentioned about the um, part-time and full-time uh, and how that has caused a gendered environment. Are there any examples of where um, there has been a change to where people or companies have allowed this um, part-time uh, situation to be more acceptable and how has that changed the situation? I'm not really aware of a big shift toward part-time employment within companies. Um, I mean, the biggest thing in recent history is the shift to a gig economy, which is a kind of a different phenomenon because gig work doesn't come with benefits or job security. So it, in some ways, it's more flexible because you can choose your work and how much you want to do, but um, it's, not, it's not really an even playing field in terms of the benefits that you can get from it. Um, so that's what I've noticed. I haven't noticed kind of a huge surge in job sharing or greater flexibility within traditional computer jobs. Okay, thank you. Um, I, we're still waiting for questions to come in. Um, we'll give them just a couple of more seconds, see if those are in there. Uh, Have you, um, while we're waiting, have you had a chance to look at other countries or is yours uh, mostly focused on the United States, your research? Um, my research is mostly focused in the United States and also um, on the United Kingdom because those in the 50s, those were kind of the computing superpowers. Um, I'm aware of some other things. Um, there's work been done on women in the Soviet Union, for example, and there were, were women working there um, um, also on the hardware side, that's something I didn't mention was that um, there's been this big gender divide where you know men do hardware, women do software. Um, certainly historically that was true because women were barred, often just explicitly barred from engineering uh, degrees. Um, that's less true now that I don't, I don't really know what the statistics are now. So that's another um, big way that computing has been has been gendered. But there's other countries where that's not the case. In the Soviet Union, lots of women were engineers. Um, uh, I interviewed Ruzhina Baichi, who had uh, grown up in Eastern Europe in, in Czechoslovakia, and she had gotten an engineering degree there and came and became a you know, robotics, uh, really high profile uh, robotics expert in the United States. Um, so she kind of brought some of that legacy with her. So it's definitely, this is not necessarily a worldwide story. 
and I would really appreciate if anyone has uh, perspectives from outside the United States who's in the audience. I would love to hear from that. Yeah, we'd love to hear those coming in. Like we were talking before the uh, the presentation about uh, the former Soviet Union. I spent, oh man, somewhere around nine years in the former Soviet Union. And one of the things that, one of the, the, the phenomena that we saw while I was there, roughly late 90s to the late 2000s, um, were the development of internet cafes. And of course, internet cafes were an incredibly gendered area. You would almost never find women in an internet internet cafe, um, at least because I was in most of the Turkic republics. Um, so you wouldn't find them there. And so what you did see a lot of times is that uh, the people coming into the fields of computing were uh, a lot of times more men than women, um, even though engineering itself more broadly seems to have about a 50-50% in the former Soviet Union. Ooh, we've got a question here. Um, this person says, earlier there were many women in computing, and then in the 90s, it dropped considerably. Many reasons were given, but none were a major factor. Is there now a pickup today? Uh, or it still seems low, they say. So what are your thoughts on this? Uh, sadly, no. Um, I mean, I, I don't know statistics for the past couple of years, but I, I doubt it's it's changed that much. I think um, I think it's hovering around twenty five percent, maybe. Um, and again, there's a lot of possible reasons, and a lot of people, including the IEEE, ACM, other organizations, NSF tried really hard to um, figure out what the problem is and get more women into computing. And I think some things have changed, but I think, again, um, these kind of structural issues are where we need to look because we, we tend to be very individualistic and look about you know, how can we help this individual person move their individual career forward. Um, but that's not going to change the big structural issues about, about time and space and unequal divisions of responsibility and um, work hours and things that um, affect people, even if it's even if it's like a friendly, welcoming workplace, you might just find it impossible to accommodate that. Um, and we haven't really wrestled with that. I mean, we're still politically in this country wrestling with, uh, you know, funding childcare and, and early education and things that would support um, support people to do things. Um, and, you know, the stereotypes about uh, technology being a masculine area are still there as well. And again, um, you know, what are our role models? How do we shape the culture? Um, what are our values? Um, I think there's a lot of things besides just, you know, let's teach girls to code. I mean, that's great. Let's teach girls to code. But putting all the responsibility on women to learn to code as if they are the problem is is not the way to solve it, I think. OK. okay. Um, I think that's I think all of the questions, the questions we have. We have. Um, uh, three. No, I think that's it. Good. Well, I would well, like to take this moment to, uh, to thank, thank Dr. Thank Dr. Abate. Abate. I'd also like I'd to thank all of you for attending. Yep, I think there's something else. Oh, just a comment. <laughs> Thank just you. Just a comment. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to take a break from history of computing. Um, at 11 a.m. tomorrow, uh, U.S. Eastern Time, Latifur Khan will provide a talk on big stream data analytics and applications. Our next in the series of webinars on the history of computing will be uh, Armenia echo echoing the world community and building a new heritage in computer science and engineering. And that'll be on November 5th at 7 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Um, um, so there's a couple oh, more questions. I, yeah, I'd like to stop. I'd like to go ahead and make those. <laughs> uh, let's see, one from Gene Freeman about the lone genius. Um, I mean, 
That's a good question. And I think there was a difference between um, kind of academic computer science and computing industry. Um, I think science is becoming more collaborative. Um, and there's, I think it's also becoming more interdisciplinary. And um, I heard uh, interesting stories from women uh, last time I went to one of the Grace Hopper conferences where you see people presenting their cutting edge research, um, really interesting stories about interdisciplinary work where computer scientists are working with, you know, biologists or something, or um, where you have this collaboration where the biologist, biologist is using the computing power and the computer scientist is using the biologist data as kind of the data set for their, their own experimentation. And this, this really kind of um, cooperative uh, way of doing research. So I think in, in academic science, there might be more of this. Um, and in the industry, obviously, you know, a successful company's got a lot of people working for it, but there still is this sort of stereotype of kind of the lone person or, you know, the 10X coder who's going to like code the whole thing by himself. Um, so I'm not sure how much that has changed, but that's a really good question. Um, there's also a statement here by someone. They say the topic about women in the former Soviet Union sounds fascinating and worth researching. I think we found somebody a research area. Um, yes, I mean, there are some people. Um, um, let me see if I can spell our name for history. From... I hope I spelled this right. Uh, did that... Did that post? I can't tell. Uh, yeah, it probably went to the, the the individual. Can you tell the person's name? Oh, sorry. Or... I was just trying to say, um, somebody who comes to mind, uh, Ekaterina Babanseva is is one historia, historian who's looking at Soviet um, computing, uh, not just not just on gender lines, but um, but including that. I think there are more people as records open up. I think there's more people. Um, Doing that, uh, Anne Fitzpatrick is another historian who looked at um, the very first computer in the Ukraine, and one of the engineers on that was a woman um, whose name I'm afraid I don't remember. But um, so there is, there is, are some people with the language skills uh, doing that work, and hopefully we'll see more of that. Yeah, that would be great. We, I would say we should probably have something like this uh, webinar on that in some time in the future. Um, there's another... <laughs> Sorry, there's another question here, a statement. I've noticed a higher number of women from India in MS degree programs. Mm -hmm. Has anyone looked at this and why women in India seem to participate in CSE engineering at a higher rate than American women? That's a really great question. Um, I personally haven't looked at this, but I, I do think there's people... Um, Looking at this, and um, I wish I had an answer to that, but but I don't. Um, I mean, obviously, India has you know really ramped up and became a computing kind of superpower um, in terms of software services, and that included creating this pipeline for people. Um, I don't know so much about that from a gender perspective. I know one issue uh, for women has been uh, H-1B visas, where people come to the United States to work in the tech industry, and typically the spouse of the visa holder is not allowed to work. And so often what happens is, um, you know, the woman in that, uh, in that relationship might also have a computer science degree, but she comes here and she can't work uh, if her husband is the one who got the visa. And so that's a way where, where gender actually, there's a kind of gender inequity because of the way our visa system works, where women who are trained can't actually take advantage of it. Um, it tends to be more often that the man who is the person with the job in that situation. Um, but yes, that's, that's great. And I hope we hear from somebody who knows about the situation in India. That would be wonderful to hear. Okay, do we have any other questions? If anybody has any questions, uh, you know, send them in now. I think what we do is we break through a, a wall and then people start asking questions. So <laughs> give them just a second. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, you mentioned China earlier. Um, 
I read a book called Working Class Network Society by uh, Q K I U. I don't remember his first name. Um, and he describes, uh, you know, internet cafes in China, and it is again this very masculine space, and apparently also a very working class um, space. Um, so that again, that issue of the spaces, the physical spaces of computing, and and how gender works there is is another important thing. Um, and just the experience, you know, a college woman walks into a classroom and there's like three women and a hundred men in the, in the class. Just being in that physical space is, is something that kind of sends you a message that you can either be thick skinned and ignored, or you might start to doubt whether you belong there. It would be interesting to see as we moved away from that period where there were the internet cafes, and more into the home internet and, and the mobile internet, and whether or not that kind of dynamic has, has changed from there. It's kind of an interesting thought. Have you, do you know anything about that? Has anybody written about that? Well, a lot of studies about um, the internet in the global south um, point out that most people are accessing it using cell phones. They're not accessing it uh, using computers. Um, and I think that mode of access also is possibly more accessible to women. I mean, they need the money to get a cell phone, but it's um, the phone is kind of a less gendered object. It's it's not considered necessarily a masculine thing, and women use it for other things. And so, um, and they have used it for you know micro businesses and things like that. Um, so I think the uh, again thinking about the the physicality of it, like what's what is the machine you actually use. Um, is another piece to look at. All right. Well, very good. I think we've reached the end of our questions. So um, I have have gone through most of the things that we have come upcoming. There's one more uh, webinar that's upcoming that is our Build Your Career webinar series, and that will be uh, Persuasive Conversations, Why Low Impact Words Don't Work by Elsa Velasco Paul. That'll be on November 18th. Registration for all of these is open now, and we'll be sending you guys a link of this and, and to future events, along with the recording of this webinar. Again, Dr. Abate, this was a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it, and I know everybody else has. Thank you for giving this. Thanks, Gary. It was my pleasure, and thank you all for coming and for your great questions.